In the late 12th century, say 1148, a boy was born to the well-to-do Guidotti family. Galgano, and gosh, does that name remind us of a certain brand of water softener? Galgano grew up to be a knight. Not your knight of Arthurian legend, all noble and chivalrous and forever rescuing damsels in distress, but the other kind who went on crusades and was ruthless and unforgiving and as hard as a brick in a sock if the sock were made out of a suit of metal. In other words, he had a reputation, and it wasn't a pleasant one by any stretch of the imagination. Reports of his life charitably call him worldly and fierce-tempered, which basically means he drinks and fights and drinks and probably gambles and then drinks some more and then is generally unpleasant to the ladies. Not everyone in armor shined like a beacon of civility. Certainly not Galgano. Which makes it all the more surprising when, late in his life, and by that we mean somewhere in his early 30s because he died at 33, Galgano starts having visions. Well, maybe not all that surprising, considering how worldly he is most nights, but even so, it becomes clear that something is up when the dreams start featuring the Archangel Michael. In the dream, the Archangel promises he will protect Galgano personally. From what, no one is quite sure. Least of all, we suspect Galgano himself. It's just a general sort of promise of protection from whatever, like an angelic get-out-of-everything-free card. Galgano isn't particularly impressed by this. After all, he got this far in life mostly by protecting himself, and seems to have done a reasonable job of it, as evidenced by the fact that he's still alive. So, assurances of protection from a dream version of a potentially drink-induced angel may not carry a whole lot of weight. Especially if, by acknowledging the existence of the Archangel, you basically have to admit you've done more than a few things wrong in life and had something you needed protecting from. Seeing that he'd failed to be convincing or to even explain exactly what he meant, Michael tries again with a second, more specific vision. This time he tells our knight to follow him and promises to show him the path to God. Guidotti, fearless and brave as ever, but still not entirely convinced, mounts up and follows the archangel down the narrow, difficult path to a hill in Tuscany called Monteseppi. Atop the hill, an amazing sight greets him. All twelve of the apostles are standing outside a little circular church waiting to say hello. Not only that, they have way better instructions about what Galgano should do than Michael did. The apostles lay it all out in clear detail and make it very plain what he should do now and how he should go about it. So convincing are they and so clear their instructions that there is no way he can have any doubts about the plan for the rest of his life. Which is probably exactly why he ignores those plans completely and goes about his usual business for at least a week. No one likes to be told what to do. Probably he has more important things to do than whatever the instructions from God said he should do. You know, like gambling and drinking and also some of that fighting and womanizing. Probably. Finally, his horse. Yes, his horse, whose name has gone unrecorded in this whole thing. His horse decides enough is enough. Instead of packing Guidotti all around the countryside so he can get even further into trouble, it refuses to go anywhere at all but to the very place pointed out in the vision. A vision, we remind you, that wasn't the horse's, it was his master's. And yet the horse took his master to exactly the right spot. We can only imagine what an eye-opening experience that must have been as they drew closer and closer and bits of it started to seem familiar to Galgano until suddenly he realized where he's seen it all before. So convincing was this to our knight, that he immediately saw the error of his ways and repented. No, of course not. You've brought the wrong knight to the story if you thought it was going to be that easy. Instead, he still doesn't believe what's going on any more than you listening to this right now believe it all really happened. Instead, he's given one more waking vision in which, at the top of the hill, he sees again the small circular church, this time with Jesus and Mary standing outside, surrounded by the apostles, with what was surely by then a you didn't listen, so now you gotta talk to the boss look on their faces. When he reaches the top, the vision fades out, and a voice speaks out of nowhere to him and says, Give up your worldly pleasures, and do as you have been told. And of course, Galgano immediately falls to his knees, repents, and follows the commands of God and the apostles. 
Wrong. Instead, he sasses back and says, Oh, sure, no problem. That's very easy for a guy like me. Just give everything up, you say? No problem. For me, that's as easy as splitting rocks with swords. And he thrusts his sword at a nearby boulder, intending to shatter the sword by way of demonstration that nobody's going to tell him what to do. At which point, the sword went straight into the rock like nobody's business and stuck there, buried up to the hilt. And you can still see the sword in the stone to this day at the remains of the little round church that was built there by Galgano, called the Montesieppi Chapel. Date authenticated and everything. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. This sort of thing happens to us a lot around here. We'll be researching something or other for the show, and in the process, we'll come across a very real-world explanation for a thing that has entered myth, legend, and folklore. In fact, it is practically the bread and butter of what we do around here as we take amazing tales of fantasy and dive back through the history of them looking for their inspirations. To take just one recent example, the whole episode about mirrors was built on the bones of one real-world explanation of the Snow White tale. This tale, of course, is a real-world example of and possible inspiration for the sword and the stone from Arthurian legend, which we covered before from a different angle a couple of years ago. Really, these angles are what it's all about. When we say things like from a different angle, what we are really saying, and not just the we who are us, but the we who are all of them out there too, is that we have adapted the story you know so well, the sword and the stone in this case, to suit our purposes and make a piece of entertainment and information that you will enjoy. Similarly, many fairy tales and folk tales, myths and legends, started with a story of an actual event or person that grew in the telling as it was adapted to the interests of the audience and the needs of the teller. In the arts, you will find all kinds of adaptations. At its most basic, adaptation just means to take a work performed or written in one style and transfer it to another. And the thing of it is, you'll pay good money to experience that adaptation, even if it is adapted from something you already know well. For proof, all you have to do is look at the box office returns for the Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings films and see how lucrative film adaptations of books you already know and love can be, and thereby also explain why Hollywood is out of ideas. They don't need new, original, specifically created for film works to survive. Doing that actually just makes it harder for the studios to stay in business. They just need to adapt already existing works you already like into new films you probably won't like as much, but will still, collectively, pay very well to see at least once. According to Hawk Otsby, producer of sci-fi's The Expanse, in an interview with The Verge in 2017, it's all about managing risk for the studios. It's extremely difficult to sell a blockbuster original script today if it isn't based on some popular or recognizable material. Audiences know the story, so they're sort of pre-sold on it. In other words, it has a recognizable intellectual property and can rise above the noise and competition from the internet, video games, and Netflix. This works the other way around as well. The collective you will pay more than reasonable amounts of money to have your favorite films, television shows, comic books, and games turned into novelizations. Film novelizations in particular are very popular, often especially because they differ in many interesting ways from what finally appears on screen. The writers are often privy to early versions of the script since they need to produce the book to coincide with the release of the film for maximum effect. As such, they see early drafts with lines of dialogue, characters, situations, and scenes that may never make it into the final version. Additionally, within the novelization, they are often given room to more fully explain context and provide information gleaned from discussions with the filmmakers that simply were too far in the background to be conveniently shown to an audience in a theater. In general, popular novelizations often expand and clarify the offerings of the film. Jim Henson's The Dark Crystal novelization by A.C.H. Smith is one example of a novelization that opens up and illuminates a world much more complex and richer than what appears on screen to the benefit of both. So, as Joe Queenan once demonstrated when writing for The Guardian in 2009 on the subject of novelizations, this can go too far, as in the case of Night at the Museum. 
A very different case is Night at the Museum, Battle of the Smithsonian, a junior novelization by Michael Anthony Steele. Unlike Night at the Museum, a junior novelization, Leslie Goldman's rewrite of Milan Trink's The Night at the Museum, the storybook on which the film Night at the Museum is based, Night at the Museum, Battle of the Smithsonian, a junior novelization is the junior novelization of the sequel to the original Night at the Museum. It is thus a sort of sequel to a film and a sequel to the novelization of a film which was in itself the junior novelization of the screenplay to a film which was based upon a book which was mostly pictures. Is that clear? So, why all this talk of adaptation? Well, as much as peeling back the layers of a story you've known for years to get at the root of its original inspiration fascinates us and entertains you, as a game master, part of your job creating adventures for your players is to adapt stories you already know or have recently encountered to the table at which you play. It can be argued, in fact, that aside from administering the rules of the game, this is the primary focus of your work as a game master, taking stories and adapting them to the game you play. We've all sat in the theater or at home after watching a movie or reading a book and thought to ourselves, that was amazing, how can I get it to the table? Even Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson did that. Their original answer to the question, how can I play stories about elves and dwarves and fight dragons and go on adventures and be a hero and swing swords and rescue people who need rescuing and punish people who need punishing and generally gallivant around a mythical kingdom enjoying myself immensely was, of course, let's invent Dungeons and Dragons. You can do all those things in the game not only because they did the hard work of adapting an entire genre of writing and film into elements of the background, story, and possibility space of the game, but also because they did the equally hard work of adapting and expanding an earlier set of rules, chainmail, into the original Dungeons and Dragons game with an eye towards supporting the sorts of stories they enjoyed reading and telling. So, at the fundamental heart of Dungeons and Dragons, and therefore all the other RPGs that came from it, is the idea of adaptation, both in story and rules. Even if you have a completely original idea for an adventure, you still have to do the work of adapting it to the rules of the game you're playing. From monster abilities, statistics, and features to the sorts of towns, caves, and even dungeons you're likely to encounter, it all requires adaptation of one sort or another to fit. And where rules in your game of choice don't mesh well with your players of choice, as a GM you are free to adapt those rules until they do fit, which is why so few people mess with encumbrance or alignment anymore. Adaptations can take many forms, even if they're based around the same original source. In one version of King Arthur's Legend, you get a Disney cartoon about amorous squirrels. In another, you get a flying circus. And in yet another, you get significantly more singing than probably existed in King Arthur's Court in Camelot, which not only adapted King Arthur's Legend, but also adapted the play it came from at the same time. Look at what's happened with Macbeth. You get Men of Respect, a gangster flick, the Japanese epic Throne of Blood from Kurosawa, and from India, a Bollywood drama called Makbul. All of which just goes to show you that you can make anything into anything else across a variety of styles and genres. One of the key things to keep in mind with your adaptations is theme. The creator of the original work will have had some key themes in mind when they made it. Macbeth, for example, has themes of ambition and greed, morality and human nature, free will and destiny, and the difference between being a tyrant and being a true king, among others. If you want to bring a Macbeth story to your table, you'll need to keep an eye on at least some of them and make a point of working them into the action. The Lion King hits all the major themes of both Hamlet and Macbeth depending on what point of view you take, and it does it all with nicely animated singing African animals. It's done obviously enough that most people get it upon seeing the film, but it can certainly be done in a more subtle fashion. The film Scotland, Pennsylvania takes the entire Macbeth idea transplants it to a fast food joint called Duncan's Cafe and makes merry of the whole thing. Variations on the themes mean that both are Macbeth, but also vastly different films. Staying on theme makes it possible to morph a story you know to fit different circumstances as needed. Deciding what to leave out is a key element in a successful adaptation. The film Greed, shot in 1924 by Eric von Stroheim, was meant to be a literal adaptation of the Frank Norris novel McTeague. So literal that the original cut of the film was over nine hours long as each scene and line from the novel was painstakingly filmed in detail. When the studio found out, they forced von Stroheim to cut the film to four hours in length and then snuck in another editor to reduce it to two hours. 
Reportedly, the film now makes no sense, having lost at least 80% of the novel. No one since has tried filming an entire novel exactly as written. Focusing on the scenes that matter and that tell the story the best is a key element, especially at your table. Depending on what your players enjoy, long scenes of dialogue may not play well and need to be shortened or even summarized. Conversely, to groups that like social interaction and the play of character against character, combat may be seen as an interruption to the narrative and need to be either heavily truncated or left out altogether. The skill lays in knowing your audience and tailoring your work to them while still delivering the story you've got in mind. Sometimes the source work has many rich and full characters that help make the whole thing go. When adapting such works to your table, it may not be practical to have all 22 speaking characters in Casablanca represented, even though most of them have a role to play in the plot. Combining several characters with minor roles into one more major character with a central role, or even writing out smaller characters and creating one new one to cover them all, is a useful technique. If three people all have the job of moving a MacGuffin around at various times, combining them into one person with three separate appearances not only streamlines the process, but also makes for a stronger character that signals something is up when they appear. Dragging every character from the previous six novels into the seventh might be a great way to fill out your page count, but it does little in the way of making your book better as they are paraded by for their one-line appearance. For these reasons, short stories are often the best adaptation fodder, which is why so many end up on screen as full-blown blockbuster films. They are by their very nature tightly written, with a limited number of characters and scenes, and a usually direct plot focusing on one or two major themes. Practically half the work is done for you already. In 1948, Arthur C. Clarke wrote The Sentinel, an eight-page story that Stanley Kubrick would later turn into 161 minutes of amazing film called 2001 A Space Odyssey. Though to be fair, Clarke did say there was little left of the original in the final film. The idea of the story, though, if competently explored, can make the film a success. Though, of ten authors surveyed, twelve of them will claim the film versions of their works aren't any good at all. James Thurber famously hated the film adaptation of his ten-page story The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, which starred Danny Kaye and we enjoyed. But he remained strangely silent on the recent Ben Stiller version, which we also quite liked, but in a totally different way. Bad adaptations are often worse than bad films in general, though. To those familiar with the original work, a bad adaptation can come across as an adaptation in name only, bearing little resemblance to its source. 2004's I, Robot notoriously has so little to do with the Asimov stories of the same name that it came as a surprise to no one to discover it hadn't been written as an adaptation of those works in the first place. To those new to the material, these very extremely loose adaptations play like any other film. The upset only comes later, when a bewildered reader just introduced to a work from its film version finds that the words on the page bear no relation to the images on the screen, the things being said, and the deeds being done. The book was better is often a justified call from the avid reader when it seems like the studio's efforts to adapt the story were merely there to get the reader inside and sat down with a ticket in hand. That's okay, though. You probably won't be turning your adapted adventure into a film that the original source or fan base can comment on. It's sadly unlikely a major studio would want to film a story based on your game anyway, as brilliant as it may be and current trends notwithstanding. Which is not to say that such things don't happen. You might get lucky. In 1986, Group SNE began a serialized replay of their Dungeons & Dragons inspired game in Japanese magazine Comptique called Record of Lodos War. Essentially an exact transcript of what transpired at the table both in and out of the game, their immense popularity led to a series of novels and short story collections, then to a manga series, and then on to an original video animation series before seeing itself adapted into an audio drama on CD. Oh, also an online game which was released in 2016, and its own set of further adapted rules called Sword World RPG. And some toys, probably. Just check. Definitely toys. Did we miss anything else? In fact, in Japan, there's a whole industry built around the publishing of RPG replays, as they're called. The players, who are often also professionals in the Japanese gaming and related industries, prepare the replays into complete, nearly ready-to-publish packages with full layout, art, and design. Commercial releases occur for those that appear particularly popular, and often sales of replays far outstrip regular fantasy works and adapted novels from other games. 
So much so that even translated games like D&D and Shadowrun see some interest as replays in a market where they never quite got a foothold as games of their own. In the end, the art of a good adaptation isn't in exactly transcribing every single little thing out of the source material. You need to work out which bits are essential and define the work you are adapting, and which bits can safely be left by the wayside. You'll want to condense where you can and expand where it's needed, so that the person or persons who eventually consume your adaptation will be able to recognize it as such, yet still appreciate it for its differences and experience the story as both you and the original creator intended. Decide on the elements that make the story the story you love and want to adapt. Understand not only the needs of your audience, but also the limitations of the media and genres you are transferring to and from. And well armed with all this information, realize that no matter how hard you try, you're still going to have to leave Tom Bombadil out. Thank you for listening to this week's GM Word of the Week. We just passed our fifth anniversary on the 20th, and we thought we'd try something a little different. We are, after all, attempting to help GMs with their games, even when we aren't being explicit about it. We hope it helped some of you. This week's shout-out goes to Aussie Dylan, and you'll never guess where they're from. Never in a million years. Aussie Dylan, a five-star legend in their own right. Thanks for the review. We're glad the transition wasn't too much for you. If you leave a review where we can find it, you might get a shout out on the show as well. So jump out there and let folks know what you think. If you've enjoyed this and other episodes of the show, please consider supporting us on Patreon. As little as a dollar gets you transcripts and early episode releases, as well as a friendly little note from me personally in appreciation. You can find out more about this and other ways to help support the show by clicking the little yellow banner at the very top of gmwordoftheweek.com. We look forward to hearing from you. This episode was researched, written, and produced and adapted by me, Brian Casey. Music used in this episode came from Blue Dot Sessions. The problem with books, now that I've written one, is that the idea of adaptation is so much easier than sitting down to write something new.